My name is Mao Rong Jiang, and I'm the director of Creighton University's Asian World Center. Welcome to the forum, Who Speaks for Islam? What a Billion Muslims Really Think, sponsored by the US Center for Citizen Diplomacy in partnership with Gallup and the World Affairs Councils of America. The Asian World Center is pleased to work with the US Center for Citizen Diplomacy to bring this event to Omaha and the Creighton campus. With support from our university president, vice presidents, deans, faculty colleagues, and students, the Asian World Center tries to serve as a small bridge across land and sea to bring different people, cultures, and political views together in an effort to make our world a better place. Most of us here, I would assume, do not yet have Facebook or MySpace. But a forum such as this is our Facebook and our space, only it is more personal. Every citizen can be a diplomat. I would like to take this opportunity to thank my colleagues, deans, and the president of the university. In particular, thanks to the university public relations office and its associate director, Cindy Walkman. Thanks also to today's panelists, Professor Nasa Arshif, Asharif, Professor Michael Kelly, and Mr. Othman Althawadi, founder and president of Credence Saudi Student Association. On behalf of the Asian World Center at Creighton University, my thanks go to Anne Shadi and M. Jessica Rowe of the US Center for Citizen Diplomacy for working with the Asian World Center to bring this national forum to Creighton. Thanks to KIOS, Omaha's NPR station, and to other medium organizations for help in bringing this forum to a broad audience in Omaha and the American heartland. The event is being recorded by KIOS and videotaped by Creighton Creative Services. Lastly, thanks to our featured speaker, Ms. Dalia Mogahed and to all of you here present for this event. A warm reception is to follow this forum on the second floor common area. Please join the reception in honor of our speakers and supporters and all of you and continue the Q&A. Now, please welcome Anne Shadi, Executive Director of the US Center for citizen diplomacy for her opening remarks. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure and certainly an honor for the US Center to be present here at Creighton University. Its outstanding record of academic achievement and excellence uh, is recognized worldwide. I want also to pay honor to uh, the Asia World Center. I noticed when I walked into the hallway and picked up a brief flyer about the center that on May 12, there was, of course, as we all know, a horrendous earthquake in China. And literally a week and a half later, the Asia World Center at Creighton had already sent 3,000 medical supplies to help those people. Hats off. <laughs> the, 
The U.S. Center was formed just 18 months ago, and it came out of a whole series across the country of community-based forums on citizen diplomacy, that being the ways in which Americans interface with the world as citizens, not our official diplomatic relationships and not the military, but that third very powerful component of our foreign policy, which has always been recognized as an important way in which our country interfaces with the rest of the world. Out of uh, those summits, there were identified a series of seven or eight serious concerns regarding the way in which Americans can and already are interfacing from partner schools and third grade efforts for pennies for peace to the Peace Corps and everything in between. Uh, we have hundreds of thousands of Americans that are doing tremendous work with the rest of the world. But there are real concerns with some of that. One of them being that in fact, we have an emerging need in this country to pay attention to helping all of us better understand our relationship and understanding uh, with the Arab world as well as the world of Islam. We haven't done a very good job uh, on that issue. And so the board of directors in its first meeting in uh, February in Des Moines of 2007 said the emerging need that we feel the center needs to address across the country is to join forces with many other organizations that are also working uh, on that effort and strengthen uh, the way in which that is being done, which has of course led us to supporting and working with the World Affairs Councils and Gallup in getting information about this very important piece of work that has been done by Gallup out to the grassroots and not only being <coughs> utilized by universities, think tanks, people in Washington, uh, those who will certainly make good use of it, but this is the kind of information that we firmly believe that all Americans should be looking at and trying to understand. So therefore, we are now involved, uh, and thanks here, this is our second forum. Uh, there will be seven that will be taken across the country, and our other partner uh, for the other five cities are the World Affairs Councils that are located in Missoula, Montana, and Springfield, Illinois, and in Naples, Florida, and all of that will go on in two more cities yet to be named. That gives you just a, a little background. And before I complete my remarks, I want to pay special note that uh, one of our wonderful board members at the U.S. Center is here. She is uh, an Iowa State Senator, Nancy Butker, lives in Harlan, and you know, it's a lot easier for her to come here than it is to go to Des Moines. Nancy, would you just rise? I I'm looking for you. You got it. There she is, right in front of me. <laughs> We're certainly fortunate to have Gallup, uh, a 70 year old internationally recognized corporation based in Omaha and Washington, whose founder, George Gallup, by the way, was born in Jefferson, Iowa. George Gallup built the corporation, and many of you Omahaans know this with a commitment to the belief that polling gives a voice to the people so that they may be heard. Traditionally, Gallup provides extensive information on its research as a product. However, because of the importance and the significance of the data that has been revealed in their recent work, then therefore the World Poll, which was taken place over six years and never attempted by any research firm they decided to sponsor and then fund a special project called the Muslim West Fact Initiative. This effort is reaching out beyond, way beyond Gallup's traditional base of corporations and governments and universities and other research organizations throughout the world to provide information on this timely topic so that more Americans and others worldwide may add to our understanding of Islam and the Muslim world. In addition to this series of public forums with the U.S. Center and the World Affairs Councils and Creighton and last night in Des Moines, two other internationally based nonprofit organizations, 
The initiative is extending information about the poll via an extensive website, which you are all encouraged to enjoy, a book, which is being discussed tonight, whose author, Dalia Mogahed, uh, is with us and will be, of course, our featured speaker. But beyond all of that, Dalia and her staff are also working with national and inter international media. They are conducting meetings with worldwide leaders, including appearances at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, the Brookings Institute, the Solia Foundation, Search for Common Ground at MIT, and none other than the Screenwriters Guild of America. Some brief ground rules for today. Dahlia will speak for about 25 to 30 minutes, and then Jessica Rowe, who is Director of Programs and Special Initiatives at the U.S. Center, will handle a Q&A session. And be, then following that, we open it all up, first to specially invited guests who are going, or just behind me, going to make their comments, and then opening it all up, of course, to all of the audience. So now it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Pio Jeskowitz, and Pio is the associate publisher for Gallup Press, and he will introduce Dahlia. Thank you very much. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Dahlia Mogahed. Dahlia is a senior analyst and executive director of the Gallup Center for Muslim Studies, which is dedicated to providing data-driven analysis of the views of Muslim populations around the world. She's co-author of the book, Who Speaks for Islam? What a Billion Muslims Really Think, which has received critical acclaim from various global thought leaders. Michael Scheuer, the former chief of the Bin Laden unit at the CIA, called Who Speaks for Islam a book Americans must read before time runs out. Archbishop Desmond Tutu said few books could be more timely. Noah Feldman, Harvard Law professor and former advisor to Paul Bremer in Iraq, called it required reading. Dallas analysis has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, LA Times, the Washington Post, Foreign Policy Magazine, the Harvard International Review, and other academic and popular journals. Her audiences have included the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations, the World Economic Forum, the Brookings Insti Institution's US Islamic World Forum, and she has discussed Gallup findings with a wide range of opinion leaders, including Tony Blair, Madeleine Albright, Newt Gingrich, Chuck Hagel, Jeffrey Sachs, Nobel laureate Daniel Kahneman, Queen Rania of Jordan, and others. Dahlia is a member of Women in International Security, and she serves on the project on US engagement with the global Muslim community, as well as on the Brookings Crisis in the Middle East Task Force. Dahlia has an undergraduate degree in chemical engineering. Her master's degree in business administration is from the Graduate School of Business at the University of Pittsburgh. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Dahlia Mogahad. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for taking the time and sacrificing uh, your personal time to be with us today. I want to talk to you today about a very important topic. Before I do, I want to tell you a little bit about the mission that started the company that I represent, the Gallup Organization. Of course, as you know, Gallup's operational headquarters are only a few blocks away right here in Omaha. Gallup was founded by a man named George Gallup, whose core mission was to help people be heard. He said, if democracy is about the will of the people, that someone should go find out what that will is. He thought that leaders made better decisions when they knew the will of the people. And it was this simple premise that was the foundation on which Dr. Gallup built his organization, the Gallup Organization, almost 70 years ago. And he was one of the first who developed a methodology to reap the wisdom of the people as a natural resource for the public good. We wrote this book to share what we've learned 
by listening to the voices of a billion Muslims, a community that has often been discussed but seldom heard because we believe that today, three quarters of a century later, Dr. Gallup's mission has never been more important. Our country was attacked on 9-11-2001 in a way that few could imagine or even believe. Shortly after, Osama bin Laden released a statement laced with religious rhetoric praising the attacks. Since then, violence has grown exponentially as Muslims and non-Muslims alike continue to be victims of global terrorism. Terrorism has occurred in Morocco to Indonesia, from Madrid to London, and wars in Afghanistan and Iraq rage on. Is this evidence of an all-out clash between Muslims and the West? The vital missing piece among the many voices weighing in on this question, and there are certainly many, is the actual views of ordinary Muslims. With all that is at stake for the United States and Muslim societies, indeed for the entire world, the time has urgently come to democratize the debate. So who speaks for Islam, what a billion Muslims really think, is about this silenced majority. This book is the product of a mammoth multi-year Gallup research study. Between 2001 and 2007, Gallup conducted tens of thousands of hour-long face-to-face -face interviews with residents of more than 35 nations that are predominantly Muslim or have substantial Muslim populations. What you see here is a map of Tanzania, a developing nation with a poor infrastructure. In spite of extreme challenges conducting research in even the most difficult terrain, Gallup insists on getting as close to a random sample as possible, since our chief research officer often reminds us that only God can truly create a completely random sample. <laughs> However, we do try to come as close as we humanly can. The red dots are called what are primary sampling units. They are actual locations of households we interviewed. As you can see, we don't just stick to easy to get to urban centers or places that have well-developed roads. Our samples represent residents, young and old, educated and illiterate, men and women, and from urban and rural backgrounds. So one of the, the commitments that we at Gallup have is, it is an extraordinarily strong dedication to rigorous methodology. And that same methodology, whether it's in the United States or Tanzania, must apply. There are polls, for example, and when they are released, you realize that they only went to a few urban centers and called it a nationwide poll. That's a little like asking only people in New York City and LA and calling that a representative sample of the United States. With the random sampling method that Gallup used, results are statistically valid within a plus or minus three point error. In English, that means our results are only 3% away had we asked every adult in the country. This is what a random sample actually gives you. In totality, we surveyed a sample representing more than 90% of the world's 1.3 billion Muslims, making this the largest, most comprehensive study of Muslim opinion ever done. 
This study is in fact just a small part of a much wider endeavor, the Gallup World Poll, where Gallup is giving a voice to the entire globe on issues of health, education, citizenship, and leadership. This colossal study is paid for entirely by Gallup. Gallup as a for-profit commercial company emphatically protects this independence by never accepting funding from any organization to do its polling. All our survey research, including of course the World Poll, is self-funded and therefore totally independent. We are therefore beholden to no one. As you can imagine, the only way to be sustainable is to create a business model around this endeavor. So we have subscribers to our full data set, similar to any other commercial research company. But because this information is so important, we published a book about the contemporary Muslim world based on our research as our contribution to the world. With the vast amounts of data that we collected, we started to mine that data and ask the tough questions that are being debated today. What motivates sympathy for terrorism? Is democracy compatible with Islam? What do women want? That's a question a lot of people are wondering. I'm not sure if I'll be able to completely answer it today. And then we allowed the data not vocal extremists, experts, pundits, or politicians to answer those questions. And let that data draw our picture. The product is the book, Who Speaks for Islam? Our data revealed far more than we could possibly cover in one book. But we wanted to cover, we wanted to include some of the, the most important insights. We uncovered a number of findings, but the most important was this. The conflict between Muslim and Western communities is far from inevitable. It is more about perceptions of policies than um, a clash of principles. However, until and unless decision makers listen directly to the people and gain an accurate understanding of this conflict, extremists on all sides will continue to gain ground. Today I will touch upon some of the most important findings regarding Muslim Western relations and then I look forward to your questions. Now one thing that's been discussed quite a bit is the idea of whether or not uh, values around freedom and democracy are compatible. Is there a fundamental clash in values around um, democracy between Muslims and the West? So we looked at our research. When we asked an open-ended question to our respondents in majority Muslim countries, we simply asked them, what do you admire most about the West? And here's what we found. When we pose this question to Muslims around the world, a trend, the most frequent response was technology. The most admired thing about the West was technology. The second most admired was liberty and democracy. When we asked that same question of Americans, we got the same two responses the same two top responses. And remember, this is an open-ended question, not a multiple choice exam, where an infinite number of possibilities are uh, available to people. Just to give you a flavor of what people said in their own words, a Saudi Arabian respondent said, freedom of the press and opinion and expression, also scientific advancement, was what they admired most about the West. In Iran, social justice and having access to nuclear power, real democracy. 
In Pakistan, they said law is above all and everyone observes the law. And also their political system is transparent and they are following democracy in its true sense. Moroccan told us it was liberty and freedom and being open-minded with each other. We also asked a question about a constitution. If people were given the opportunity to write, draft their own constitution for a new country, what basic guarantees would they include? And so we asked about freedom of speech. And we defined it for people in case they didn't understand what it meant. We said it meant being able to say whatever you wanted about the political, social, and economic issues of the day. We found that strong majorities around the world said that they would include freedom of speech as a fundamental right in this theoretical constitution. You can see that Egyptians, 94%, uh, similar to Americans, 97%, and, and uh, <clears throat> all the percentages are uh, strong majorities. We also asked people their dreams for the future. What we didn't hear, what people didn't say is they, they didn't say their dream was to wage jihad, but instead we heard about getting a better job, better economic well-being and prosperity, and offering a better future for their children. We heard this from 70% of Indonesians and 54% of Iranians, for example. But Muslims wish to achieve this progress within their own religion and culture and neither be preached to by the West or forced to adopt Western culture. So while admiring much about the West, they wish to achieve progress through their own culture and in their own way. Despite admiring much about the West, few said adopting Western values would help Muslims progress. Instead, among the statements most frequently associated with the Muslim world was attachment to spiritual and moral values would help people progress. However, this attachment should not be mistaken for a desire to be isolated from the West. In fact, eager to have better relations with the West was also among the statements most frequently associated with the Muslim world. In fact, residents of Muslim countries and Americans agree that greater interaction between Muslims and Western communities is more a benefit than a threat, which really underscores why the, the work that Anne is doing and the, the Asia Foundation is doing is so important. However, Muslims actually do not see the West, quote unquote, as monolithic. Their perception of different nations falls along policy, not cultural or religious lines. For example, while the United States and the United Kingdom are viewed negatively, views of France and Germany are neutral to positive. In fact, they are viewed as positively as are other Muslim majority countries. For example, 74% of Egyptians have unfavorable views of the United States and 69 say the same thing about Britain. However, only 21% express this view of France while 30% express this view of Pakistan. This issue becomes especially clear when we compare the United States to our neighbor to the north, Canada, which has been called, not by me, but by others, America without the foreign policy. Not sure how Canadians feel about that. For example, while 67% of Kuwaitis have unfavorable views of the United States, this percentage for Canada is 3%.
what is often, what is perhaps most telling is when we're asked, when respondents are asked to associate different descriptors with different countries. And when you look at a weighted average across the entire database, we found that 70% of our respondents give the United States uh, a descriptor of ruthless, while only 8% and 6% say the same about France and Germany. For many Muslims, the ruthless label is likely reflected in attitudes about the UK and US-led invasion of Iraq, which vast majorities say did more harm than good. Muslims clearly see the conflict as not with Western civilization as a whole, but instead with specific Western powers based on the negative perception of their policies, not their principles. Many Muslims around the world, while admiring Western values, believe that some Western powers do not live these values in their treatment of Muslims. For example, significant percentages of Muslims around the world do not believe the US is serious about democracy in their region. This is the view especially in countries where democratic promotion has been the loudest, such as Egypt and Pakistan. What Muslims say they admire most about the West, they in fact associate most strongly, specifically with the United States. That is, citizen liberties. Yet at the same time, they believe the US is denying Muslims these same rights of self-determination. Doubting American intentions with regard to democracy are closely tied with the perception that America is a hegemonic neo-colonial power that controls the region. More than 65% of Egyptians, Jordanians, and Iranians believe that the US will not allow people in their region to fashion their own political future as they see fit without direct US influence. To explain the deep gap between America's espoused values of democracy, human rights, and self-determination, on one hand, and its perceived treatment of Muslims on the other, Muslims turn to the belief that America and its allies must simply be hostile toward Islam and regard Muslims as inferior. The idea being that since the perceived way Muslims are treated, is so antithetical to the admired Western values, <clears throat> these same Western powers must simply be singling Muslims out. So not surprisingly, when we ask Muslims to tell us what the West can do to improve relations with the Muslim world, the most frequent response, whether we're asking people in Turkey or Saudi Arabia, Morocco or Indonesia, is for the West to demonstrate more respect and to regard Muslims as equals and not inferior. This is a respondent in Lebanon that just gives you an example of what we hear all around the world. The West should treat Muslims equally to improve their relations because they look down upon us. We asked a very direct question. Do you believe the Western world respects the Muslim world? and found, probably not very surprising, large percentages of people, especially Palestinians, Egyptians, even Turks, Saudi Arabians, saying no, they did not think the Western world respected the Muslim world. What was somewhat of a surprise, though, was that the majority of Americans agreed. In fact, anti-Muslim sentiment is unfortunately widespread in the US. <clears throat> For example, Gallup asked this question, thinking very honestly about your feelings, how much prejudice, if any, do you feel toward the following religious groups? And here's what we heard when we asked about Jews. 
74% claimed they had no prejudice, while the remainder said they had at least some prejudice, which shows us that anti-Semitism is unfortunately not yet a relic of the past. When we ask the same question about Muslims, only 34% said no prejudice, while the majority said at least some prejudice. An alarming 19%, nearly one out of five, admitted to having a great deal of prejudice. In 2006, 26% of Americans said they had favorable views of Muslims compared to 30% who said they had negative views. A net of a negative 4%. And among the most negatively viewed religious groups in the United States, only topping atheists and Scientologists. Now that was in 2006, where the net was negative four. We asked the same question in 2008, March to be, um, to be <clears throat> exact. And if we look at what has happened between 2006 and 2008, there has not been another terrorist attack and the violence in Iraq has actually improved, uh, gotten uh, decreased because of the surge. So we might expect things to have gotten a bit better. But unfortunately, what we found is that in March of 2008, the net was a negative 17, where 17% 17 of Americans said they had favorable views of Muslims, and 34 said they had unfavorable. <clears throat> Still, the average American cannot be blamed for these misperceptions. Media content analysis conducted by a, a firm in Germany called Media Tenor, found that the majority, in many cases, of coverage on Islam is sharply negative in US news media. Americans are bombarded every day with news stories about Muslims and majority Muslim countries in which vocal extremists, not evidence, drive perceptions. If you notice here, the time is frame is actually almost exactly between our two measurements, between the, uh, the end, the last quarter of 2006, and March of 2008. Media Tenor also found that Islam was the most reported on, the most frequently reported on religion in US news media. At the same time, uh, that's what you see in the blue bars. That's the volume of reporting. On the other side is the quality of reporting. Red is negative, yellow is neutral, and green is positive. So if you look at volume times quality, it's clear, it's, it's very easy to see where the negative perception will come from. Media Tenor also found that if we ask the news media who speaks for Islam, 53% of the time would be militants. So the analyst writes, reporting about religious protagonists was rather unbalanced in US news media. While Muslims were frequently associated with militant groups, 53% of the time, 68% of descriptions of Christianity referred to religious organizations or clerics. Now, the, the, the main the, the issue of militancy, the, at the heart of the, uh, the issue of, or the, the negative perception of Islam, is the issue and the question of violence. And does Islam promote violence? Do Muslims, are they pro predisposed to supporting violence? So we asked this question. There was a press conference shortly after 9-11. And Donald Rumsfeld was asked, how does the Arab street feel about the attacks? His response was, I don't know. It's not like you can take a Gallup poll. <laughs> so we did. And here's what we found out. <clears throat> 
we identified one group, 7% of the global Muslim community, 90% of it that we talked to, who looked distinctly different from the rest. They thought 9-11 was completely justified and had unfavorable opinions of the United States. The reason we broke out this group is because of how dramatically different they looked on other questions. They were far more likely to say sacrificing one's life for a cause one believes in is justified, and far more likely than fours, threes, twos, and ones to say that um, attacks on civilians in general were justified. And so we broke them out because they, they clustered out in the data analysis. We wanted to compare them with the residual group. And so the first comparison, the first thing we looked at was religiosity. And our first finding was the lack of a finding. We found no difference between this 7% and the rest in terms of religion being an important part of their daily life. There was no distinguishing um, power to religiosity in in, in uh, discriminating between the two groups. In a number of countries, we asked a follow-up question after we asked people about 9-11, where we simply asked, why do you say that after the respondent told us their opinion of 9-11? So if they said it wasn't justified, we said, why do you say that? And if they said it was, we said the same thing. Why do you say that? Here's what we heard from the mainstream. They talked about the moral objection to terrorism, that it was the loss of human life, uh, that innocent people who had not committed a crime had been killed, not surprisingly. And some uh, referred to their religious beliefs to, to talk about that moral objection, saying that God hated murder, sometimes quoting from the Quran verses that talk about uh, <clears throat> the prohibition of killing innocent civilians. What was interesting was that the 7% who said it was completely justified, not a single one of those respondents gave religious justifications. Not one referred to verses from the Quran to justify their position. Instead, they used very secular political justifications such as America is a imperialist power trying to control the world, uh, accusing America of killing civilians, that, that this is what they deserve. We also looked at the much broader question of attacks on civilians. Are attacks deliberately or targeting civilians, deliberately targeting civilians, how justified are they? And we asked the American public and we asked Muslim publics around the world um, in many other countries, but I chose the countries that are most associated with militancy in the media, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Pakistan, Lebanon, and found that America, the American public and Muslim publics around the world were as likely to denounce attacks on civilians as justified. Our studies show that 6% of Americans think the attacks on civilians are completely justified. So that's the group that we identified before in 9-11, the completely justified group. In Saudi Arabia, this figure is 4%. In Lebanon and Iran, it's 2%, which as you would remember from the beginning, is within our margin of error. In the end, though, the current conflict between the West and the Muslim, Muslim communities is not inevitable. It is about policy, not a clash about religion or principles. Polls have found that the Lebanese, Christian and Muslim hold each other in high regard. More than 90% have favorable opinions of each other. Despite a decades-long civil war in Lebanon, fought roughly along confessional lines. 
Today, less than a generation after the civil rights struggle, a majority of blacks and whites in America say relations between their groups are good. Where in 1958, only 4% of Americans approved of marriage between blacks and whites, today that number is 80%. These hopeful examples underscore the possibility of improving relations between groups, even those with conflicts lasting centuries and the relative speed by which this is possible. Rather than allow extremists on either side to dictate how we discuss Muslims and the West, we need to instead listen carefully to the voices of ordinary people and thus let facts, not fear, shape our global engagement. Thank you. Thank you. We've, uh, hello, my name is Jessica Rowe. I'm a consultant with the US Center for Citizen Diplomacy, and I'm going to moderate the question and answer. And before we invite the audience to pose questions to Ms. Mulgahead, which you will do so at the microphone, uh, we have, through uh, Creighton University and the Asian World Center, uh, invited three distinguished individuals who have been prepared uh, questions to pose first to Dahlia. And I will introduce them to you and then ask them uh, to, to speak. Okay. Now first, uh, it is uh, Ahmed uh, Afwadi, yes. who is the uh, president of the Creighton School or so Saudi Student Association. Yes. Uh, next is uh, Dr. Nasser Al-Shari, who's an associate professor of pharmacy sciences. Then there's Professor Michael Kelly from the Law School of Creighton. Uh, my question uh, to you, Dahlia, is I'm, I'm sure you saw the, um, uh, the poll that was released in, in the New York Times on Sunday uh, about the Arab media. Uh, that was conducted um, by the Kamal Adams Center at the American University of Cairo, and they surveyed 601 uh, journalists in 13 Arab countries. And there were two striking findings, I thought, and I'm, I'm just kind of wondering if this tracks your broader findings. Your poll was of the entire Muslim world. Theirs was just a slice of that, the, the Arab world, and really only a slice of the Arab population, the journalists, which are sort of elites. And I'm sure yours went far deeper than that. But two of the things they found was, with respect to attitudes towards the United States, uh, there was an 89% unfavorable rating toward U.S. policy, uh, but only a 38% unfavorable rating toward the American people. So there was a clear disconnect between Americans and American policy, at least with Arab journalists uh, in the media. And then with respect to America in the Middle East, um, there was an 83% uh, negative rating for the U.S. role in the Middle East, uh, but only a 46% negative rating uh, for uh, U.S. interference in the region if it leads to benefits. So there was a distinct pragmatism um, that, that came out in that poll as well. And granted, this is only uh, Arab journalists and only Arabs within the Muslim world, but does that track your broader findings or does that dissipate as you move further away from the Arab world into the other parts of the Islamic world? That trend definitely tracks in terms of the, the first thing, which is the uh, distinction people make between the U.S. policy and, and U.S. people. And I'll just tell you a quick story that I, I always think is fascinating. Um, there was a survey, uh, again, not of everybody, but of young people coming to the United States for an exchange program. And so this was the survey they did before the young people had, had, had come to the U.S. It was about 1,000 high school students that were brought over through a State Department program. 
And they were, uh, and, and so the survey showed that 90% of them thought Americans were friendly. 90% thought Americans were friendly. And the vast majority had never met an American. I was really perplexed by that because when you look at our data on the American government, you've got 90% saying it's, it's, it's ruthless or in some places, or it's, um, it's not trustworthy, it's aggressive, uh, only 7% saying it's friendly. So yet you've got these, these dramatically different perceptions of the American people on one hand, the American government on the other, and yet people haven't met a single American. So where are they getting this idea from? And I was talking to a young woman in, in Egypt uh, last summer, and I asked her this, where are people getting this idea? You know, why aren't they conflating, and you might expect, conflating uh, the American people and the American government? And she said, friends. I said, what? She said, the show Friends. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it really is true. Uh, even though Hollywood is often accused of doing a lot of negative, it, it has succeeded in humanizing the American people. And so that, that is something we see in our data where there is a big difference between the American, American policy and the American people. The second piece is a negative role, uh, but 46 it would, it, uh, percent, vast majority saying that um, America plays a negative role, but it would be positive if it, if it leads to benefit. And we do find that in that we, when we ask people, um, what can the U.S. do uh, <clears throat> to improve relations? Or what can the, the West, we've asked at the West, we've asked at the U.S. And, and have seen that they're very similar. And basically, uh, we get two, two kinds of answers. We get the people who say, just leave us alone. And that's all you can do. And then there are people who are slightly more pragmatic who say, actually, we'd like you to maybe transfer some technology. We'd like you to help us um, with learning your, your ex more about business expertise, uh, capacity building. Nobody asks for more aid. I mean, absolutely no one asks for aid in general, let alone more aid. They really are very interested in being, uh, having capacity building and being helped to help themselves, essentially. Um, so when it benefits, when there's a benefit, then many people are very glad to accept American help. Uh, but as of now, the idea or the, the, the perception is that it's not being, it's not very beneficial. But if it were, then some people, many people, would be very happy to receive that help. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, I just want to commend the work that was done and commend also Gallup for taking such a, a great task. I think for us uh, Muslims and Arabs that have lived in this country, this is a work that validates a lot of what we went through. I do recall as a young uh, pharmacy student going to a presentation by the State Department representative to the Middle East, and I, that was in 1983, and I asked the question, is there going to be a time when our country, well, at that time I wasn't an American citizen, that this country will associate itself with the aspiration of the people of that part of the world rather than corrupt leaders in that part of the world? And that was in 1982, and I wasn't even that savvy about politics and so on. And I asked that question, and I didn't even know about the doctrine, the Bush doctrine and democracy and all that stuff what, that we hear now. So this concept really is in the minds of people in that part of the world, not b from this survey. It's been around for a long, long time. For me being here and kind of getting more involved in activism and so on, looking at the Omaha World Herald and covering uh, the Arab Muslim world, and for a year and a half, trying to publish in the public pulse or editorials and so on, looking at the uh, uh, international page and looking at the images from the Arab world, just the coverage in terms of the headlines being all negative, being all violent, the pictures of kids with guns and so on, which is completely different than what I'm used to, my great-grandparents, grandparents and so on that lived in that part of the world and how they live. And I always compare them to the Huxtables and the Waltons of this country, but sadly enough, they're not represented in the media as such, so, which is very sad, very unfortunate. 
And certainly as a faculty member traveling from 1995 to up to last year and presenting at institutions from Kuwait to Jordan to Egypt to Palestine, I don't recall one single ordinary, and I love that concept, ordinary people in that part of the world saying anything negative about this country. On the contrary, a lot of the sentiments in terms of the questions were the sentiments that I heard from professionals to ordinary people in Jerusalem talking about how hard their life is, but still acknowledging that America can improve their life and America is the one that can help them you know, in the occupation or whatever. So I don't recall anything in terms of people saying we hate America or we hate their way of life. On the contrary, they appreciate and admire our way of life and yes, the liberty and so on, what we have in this country. So it's a validation really for what I went through in this country and I would say in terms of 2001, uh, I always had my statistical analysis as a scientist. The largest I heard in terms of the camps in Afghanistan is about 10,000, 15,000 of bin Laden followers. Multiply that by 10 or 15, that's 1.5 million. That's about 0.1% of the 1.3 billion Muslims in the world. So we all try to struggle with how can we explain that part of the world in terms of the ordinary people and our ways living the, in, in this country. So I really do appreciate this work in terms of, especially you know, with the association with Gallup, and hopefully it will make a difference. I guess my question is relating to the future. We do have an election in this country. I don't know what extent you know, the Bush administration will be impacted by such kind of work with kind of the message that we got for the last eight years. What is the hope with this kind of work with an Obama, a Clinton, or a McCain, and what kind of work is being done to educate people that are coming, especially in this country, and I don't want to talk about Europe, but you know, is there, can you give us some idea in terms of how can these be used, this kind of work, to help the future? in terms of the two words and who is gonna be the leader of this particular country. Thank you. We're doing a number of things, uh, as Anne mentioned, as a part of our Muslim West Facts Initiative to get this information out to leaders in, in because of uh, the belief that Dr. Gallup had that, that the wisdom of the people is uh, something that helps leaders make better decisions. And so we've sent copy of our book to every member of Congress, and we've briefed and, um, and uh, <clears throat> talked to, engaged, and met with several leaders in Washington and outside of Washington, and we are working to meet with each of the campaigns. Hi. Um, I have a question. I'm, uh, as a Muslim from Saudi Arabia, um, I came to this country two years ago, and I came to prior to 9-11 as well. I was here in 95 and in 99. Um, this book uh, meticulously breaks all the stereotype of Muslims. I, when I read the book, uh, I always write a note, and I flip to the second page or the second chapter, I have my note being answered or my question being answered. Really, this book uh, helped me understand my Muslim brother as well. Um, I was surprised sometimes, and I was happy most of the times. Um, a Muslim usually here being presented in the media most of the time is like an angry mob marching in the street and burning the flags, which is really happening in the, in the reality. Um, the fact that Muslims like technology and like uh, being, want to be under the democratic government as well, this is makes uh, the saying that uh, they hate our life or they hate, sorry, they hate uh, our way of lives as credible as mission accomplished. So it's only media talk. I mean, all media talk. It's not something that uh, really on the ground. I have uh, my question is um, most of the positive sign from uh, signs of, from uh, Muslim population. Uh, they like democracy and they want to be. Um, they want uh, to have technology and they admire a lot about the West. Those people, the same people, they are not as powerful as the American citizen. So American citizen, they have access to the power. They can change. The rest of the world, especially Muslim and Arab, they, they don't have as power as the Americans because they are under undemocratic government, most of them. <laughs> so what's the hope message and what's the situation? Because here we see people are hope, uh, hopeful but are powerless. That's in the Muslim world. And here we have people less hopeful and more powerful. 
So how we balance things out, how we, we progress from here on out. And thank you. I think you ask a very good and important question. Um, I, I'll talk a little bit about the, the idea of really an informed democracy, because we, we do have the power to elect our own leaders here in the United States, that power comes with a great deal of responsibility, of course. And that responsibility is just simply to be well informed. So I would say that uh, I think the future is that Americans are, according to our research, very interested and hungry for information. And, uh, and we hope that this research does inform people as they make decisions about uh, their political choices. Thank you for coming to meet with us today. Um, in one of your most recent answers, you mentioned that some of the respondents indicated that they really didn't want any help at all or perhaps in, in help in the um, guise of technology. I'm interested, rather than with the broad word help, um, ways of demonstrating respect. From this, and certainly from some of your slides, it indicates that whether someone was um, considered a radical or considered mainstream, what came out as the most important priority was for the, the West, or specifically the United States, to demonstrate respect. So then did you give, um, did your researchers give participants an opportunity, either open-ended or by ranking, of specific ways that respect can be demonstrated? That's a very good question. That is our follow-up research, and we're in the field right now with that exact question of, of how do, what does respect mean? How does one demonstrate respect? From just the data we've gathered thus far, what we have, what we find is that the issue of respect comes from two things. How we, how our leaders or the representatives of the United States talk and how they treat Muslims, or at least how they're perceived to treat Muslims. Here's a, a fundamental uh, principle. If, if you admire someone and think that they stand for um, admirable values, and then that same person is perceived to treat you in a very uh, less than admirable way, then that will be perceived as more of a, a type of prejudice or, or disrespect than if you simply uh, didn't respect or admire that person and that person treats everybody badly. So um, it's, it's kind of the difference between um, you know, a, dictator, a dictatorial government, which might do much of the same, and, and the reaction that uh, people had when the United States say, uh, you know, when the, the pictures of Abu Ghraib were released. So one U.S. diplomat told me that when she was in Egypt, and she was actually in Egypt when the, when the, uh, the, the whole thing broke, that people would tell her, we expect this from our government, but not from you. And so it, it is actually because we've set the, the bar somewhat high that this whole issue of respect comes out because of this disconnect between values and, um, and the way people are perceived to be treated. Uh, Bob Robeson, just a citizen. Uh, you showed a view graph on what the American TV was, where the impressions come from the Muslim world. Where do the majority of the people receive their information that is anti, you know, <coughs> if people feel that they are, that America is good and 90% of the people like Americans, where are they getting the, where the 90 or 80% the slide? Does that make sense? Yes, I think I know what you're saying. You're asking where are people getting their information about America and how does their media content look? Is that it? it yes. It's like, it, is Al, Al Jazeera or is it newspapers or? Yes, okay. Yes, that makes sense. Well, Al Jazeera is the most viewed uh, TV station 
TV news satellite station in the Arab world. So it's, it's an Arabic station, so it's viewed by Arabs. And they also have an English station that's viewed much wider. But if we focus on the Arabic station, it's the most viewed. And we found two interesting findings. One, that uh, TV portrayals of America all over the world, actually, not even just in the Muslim world, is negative right now. We also found that Al Jazeera, even though it does have negative portrayals of America, has neutral portrayals of Christianity. So if we look at the comparable thing. Um, but that when we look at people who have positive opinions of the US and compare them to people with negative opinions of the US, those two groups are as likely to watch Al Jazeera on a weekly basis. So watching Al Jazeera didn't actually, there was no difference between those two groups. So a lot of studies have shown that simply watching Al Jazeera is not enough um, to make someone have anti-American sentiment. But that there are you know, other things, their interpretation of the news. Um, but that said, it is still a very negative portrayal of the US. And that, is that likewise in newspapers and, and magazines and others? Yes, this, the media content analysis did look at print media as well. Yes. Do you have that in your book? Or is that oh, study? we didn't put That's media not, content in the book. It's we just, not part of the survey. No, it's not. It's from Media Tenor. It's a different organization okay. entirely. Um, Salaam alaikum, sister. My name is uh, Bilal Khaliq. Um, mashallah, I want to commend you and congratulate you, the organization and yourself, for doing such great research. Um, just like um, you know, Al Gore put out The Inconvenient Truth, and it was a movie version, went in all the cinemas, uh, movie theaters, uh, do you have any plans of putting uh, this in a different format besides a book uh, that could be you know, shown in, a, in maybe in an hour or so? And also, um, just as a, a local Muslim resident, what can we use from this book or a presentation, things like that, to inform our neighbors uh, and the people that we associate with? Great. We are actually planning on making a documentary about the book, so that's in the works. Um, the other thing is that we are also planning on creating a PowerPoint compendium to the book so that it can be used by educators or community organizations. And that hopefully should be uh, finished by the end of the summer. And, um, and, and uh, so those are the kinds of things you can use. And, and our website has short briefs that people can just read quickly, lots of short articles. Our website, if you're interested, is muslimwestfacts.com. Okay. And Gala, being a for-profit organization, is there any copyright issues if we do use some of those surveys or facts? No, there isn't. No. Not if it's on the website. Then it's free to the public. Thank you. My name is Jeff Smith, and I'd just like to ask a research-related question and then a uh, question that so has, a, has an historical component to it. Taking into account the distinction that you said Muslim people made between U.S. policy and its people, uh, I'm left wondering what was the age of the participants in this study, uh, especially related to uh, militancy and the ruthlessness of our federal government and the hostility that, that, comes, uh, that comes along with that. Because Historically, the British were the only, is the only country that's ever been, that's, where it's ever been said that the sun never sets on the British Empire. And so they have actually been the country who's probably done more as it relates to colonization, or ruthless colonization. And, and the fact of the matter is that uh, the U.S. government uh, isn't even comparable in scope or purpose for the actions that we that they've taken as a as a government, and so I'm wondering that what's the age of the participants? Because my sense is that probably older Muslims might remember what the British did throughout the the Middle East, where maybe the, the younger ones would not. Okay, good, thank you. The age range was 15, <clears throat> really losing my voice. I'm sorry. Fifteen and older, fifteen and older were the it was the age range that we interviewed. And we interviewed them based on their population um, percentage. So in countries where 
majority are young people. We are, our data, our, our sample is majority young people, so it represents the demographics of the country. And we found that in general, not just among Muslims, but in general, that young people are more likely than older people to fall in that radical category. And they are more angry, and they are more frustrated. Um, so th that's, what we, that's what we found. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Dick Lucia, one of the things as I, I read in, in the survey here that you have, and, and my understanding that, of course, I don't have a, the real knowledge of the Koran because I have not read that much of it. But uh, I'd like to have your opinion when they talk about the third model in which religion principles and democracy values coexist. They want their own democratic model that draws on Islamic law as a source. And of course, relating back to the media in terms of the Quran and, and things, many of us may have different views of what is there. Would you, would you talk a little bit about this third model? Sure. I'll start by, by actually giving you <clears throat> what I think was surprising data about Americans. So we asked that question of Americans. Now, we didn't say Sharia, we said the Bible. But we asked the same question. Do you think the Bible should be the only source of legislation, a source but not the only source, or not a source of legislation? We found that 57% of Americans think the Bible should be a source of legislation. 9% of them think it should be the only source. So there's a whole negotiating of religion and democracy right here in the United States. And um, so there, there's all kinds of interpretations of what democracy means looking across the West. Democracy in the United States looks very different than Britain, looks very different than France, and so on. So there isn't just one model that I can point to and say Muslims want this. What we, what we have found is when we ask people, what does Sharia mean to you? What does Sharia compliance actually mean to you? It's a very loaded word. And when you look at uh, the data, essentially Sharia compliance is the rule of law. It's, it's a law that no one is above. It's a law that uh, is not subject to the whim of a tyrant because it's from God. And so it limits the power of government. Um, when we ask about specific things, do you associate Sharia with empowerment of women or justice for women or cruelty to women? So we ask all kinds of questions about what does Sharia actually mean? And what we come out with is it really to people, what they hear when they hear that word, they're not thinking about cruel um, punishments necessarily, they're thinking about social justice. So I think it's important to get an understanding of, of from Muslim eyes, and that's what's really important since they're the ones that are gonna be living with it, what does that word mean to them according to the research? <coughs> Hopefully that sheds some light. I'm starting to totally. Lose I'm a student here right now at UNO. Um, I guess. Could you introduce yourself? Oh, sorry. I'm Mike Powell. I'm a student here. Um, it was interesting to see in your study that you were able to finally determine a true grasp of the magnitude of the portion you cut out as the more extremist group, the 7% that justified the attacks of September 11th, as compared with the 92%, I believe, that would be the rest of the Muslim community. Um, because of obviously the, uh, the media focus on this group, I think that it's obviously an important part that's highlighted itself as, as a need to start to clear up the, the, I guess what's actually happening, the true beliefs of the Muslim pop population as compared with the U.S. versus the media coverage, which we've shown to be um, not accurate. Did you in your studies have any, any sort of um, polling or research of the, Muslim, the other 92% of the Muslim population and their perspective on the 7%, the extremists? Yes. Um, <clears throat> we asked everybody the, the same questions, but that's a very good point. I'll give you some examples of what we found. 
We ask people to tell us their greatest fear for their country, or their greatest fear. And the most frequent response among the mainstream was issues of personal security, including being actually a victim of terrorism. People actually talked about that. And it's not surprising because Muslims are the primary victims of terrorism. We also found that when we asked people what can the Muslim world do to improve relations with the West, the other way, the most frequent response was to control extremism. Um, so that, that's what the general public feels about extremists. And we also asked the general question how people feel about attacks deliberately to target civilians. And you saw the data of, uh, of how people responded to that question. I'm Jenny Zeeland. I'm a student here at Creighton University. And I want to thank you for coming. And your study um, of Tanzania is mind-blowing for the random sample. I'm just completely blown away with the results that you got. That is, you should be very proud of yourself. But OK, we're running out of time. And um, anyways, uh, everybody's asked my questions, kind of. So I'll try to sum it up. Um, what were your numbers? I couldn't really see um, your numbers because I was back there. What was your random sample for Americans? Okay. That's not my question. Can I ask more than that? Okay. That's a lame question. Sure, sure. Um, that just to begin with, just because like we had the random sampling for the um, Islam or the Muslims, um, you know what I'm saying? Because I didn't get a number for how many were in the random sample for the people that you asked. For the Americans, for there was a thousand people in each country in randomly each, in, selected. Okay, yes. that that's what the sample yeah. group was for each. Right. Okay. Um, basically, what I noticed was, you know, it, um, I just find it so flabbergasting the results that you got, uh, based on the fact that um, the the favorable response of Muslims for the Americans. Like uh, adopting, wanting to adopt Western progress, um, you know, it would not necessarily be helpful for the East, but they want better relations. It kind of goes against Samuel Huntington's clash of civilizations, mm -hmm. is what went through my head. Right. Basically, it's kind of like they want global help, but they don't That's want us to cool. come in and take over. And obviously, which everybody knows, but that seems to be the problem, and we can't get that through our heads. Is there a way in um, your book that can help um, sort of help us work together and not just come in and like take over in the sense of, I'm hurrying and now I'm nervous. The joint force is working on an effort to understand Islam, but just not, okay, because there's Al Jazeera that's doing their thing. There's our news networks that are doing our thing. How do you regulate that? Like, we're, like, through blogging, you know, like, is it up to the individual to, to you know what I'm saying? Because they're, everybody's going to do whatever they want. Right. How do you stop the kind of freight train that's already going with people's own ideologies? You know, like, just as a matter of fact, just, you know, Barack Obama last weekend, this woman in West Virginia says, I'm tired of this Hussein thing. And that's the kind of thing that we're dealing with here. How do you get through that? That's, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not an easy question. Oh, I, you, know, and I, you know, I understand that, you know. And, sure. And, 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 and it's just, it's kind of like... I have, you know, obviously we have ideas, you have books, you know, I have papers, but it, it's like, how do you just, do you just keep talking and breaking down just barriers? Or oh, I, I think do you do it individually or do you just try to like have groups or I, like? I think there's a lot of things we can do. First of all, and, and I'll just focus on here, on us here in the United States because that's who's here. So I want, I'll just focus on us. There's a lot of things we can, we don't have to feel helpless about the media. We're the consumers of the media. We are, the, we are their customers. But I feel like they're and lying we, to us. Well, all the time. we need to demand better, better, you know, better quality. 
We just we need to the demand it. And if we, do, we have to go get it. Yes, yeah, so we have to. We have to just demand more and better things from our media and our, from our uh, representatives. That's one thing. I, I go through in the women's chapter some recommendations on how to how can Western advocates for Muslim women approach the issue in a more constructive way than taking over, just like your question. Right. So there's some recommendations in that 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 might be helpful. Right. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you. Uh, I'm Mohammed Al Hajj from Kate University, and I I have uh, experience, you know want to share you about that, about this topic, Islam and West. Actually, um, from my experience now, I have been in the United States for almost three years. I am a great university student. I feel like I hom I'm in my home country. About the populations, about, you know, everything. I got all my rights, I have mosque to pray, I got everything. And also, I have experience in my country, you know, for ordinary people, everybody friendly. But also, you know, what is this coming from? Also from the book, I'm a Muslim, the Quran, you know, forbid for if for people to violence against religious and against, you know, others do you without have a, any do you have a reasons. Question for Dahlia, you, you know, ask? yeah. Also, my questions here, my point: Is this problem between people who want to control the power in the Middle East and those people? Historically, I know, or everybody know, have relationship between. Uh, with American leaders. Mm. So what do you think now? This problem, Osama bin Laden and his group, and now the war or leaders here wanna fight and you know and 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 direct the, the media. All this I'm, I totally believe that this is just between those people who wanna control the power in Middle East mm -hmm. and those people who are before they are trained and they know what they're gonna do and they just wanna control them. I don't know. Just, I guess this is simple like this. What do you see? Thank you. Well, what I think, I mean, what I hear from your question or your comment is, is that it's kind of a battle between two extremes and it's a, it's a battle of, of <clears throat> about power between two extremes. And I guess I just go back to the, it really is the premise of, of our book is that we only do hear from a very small fringe, a vocal fringe on both sides. And the views of the rest of the population, the vast majority who tell us that they reject both extremes are silenced. And we really use that word very deliberately because these, the, the vast majority, they're not silent, they're silenced. They're silenced by um, media that ignores them, they're silenced by vocal extremists that uh, are out, out yell, out, uh, out um, just like me, I can't even talk. <laughs> <clears throat> I just have louder voices. And so it is important that we do start to get a more scientific, representative view of what's really going on, and I think that's the first step to solving the problem. Patrick Murray, I teach here at Creighton. I wonder uh, what it says about the formation of opinion in the U.S. about Arab and Muslim people uh, that in the wake of 9-11, it seemed to me there was really no public outcry against Saudi Arabia. Uh, even though most of the perpetrators were Saudi, bin Laden Saudi, uh, there was also seemed to be almost no reaction to one of the early consequences of the Iraq war, which was that Saudi Arabia uh, sent the U.S. military forces out of Saudi Arabia, which seemed to be one of the leading demands of uh, bin Laden and Al Qaeda, as I understand it. This seemed to be just not registered. So what, what does it say about the formation? Uh, I mean, you emphasize the differentials in 
how Muslims look at different Western countries, but what, what do these things say about the formation of opinion uh, by people in the U.S. about Arabs and Muslims? Well, I guess I'll just start by what we know about American opinion of different countries. And the, the most negatively viewed countries by Americans are North Korea, Iran, and Saudi Arabia, actually. And I think it is because of, uh, and I do think Saudi Arabia is, is quite, I mean, I don't, I don't think this is even, it's not very easy to, to not, it's not very easy to miss. Saudi Arabia is, is pretty demonized in the media. I don't think I ever heard anything positive about Saudi Arabia in our media. And it is the most, among the most negatively viewed countries in the, in, in the world for Americans. Iran, North Korea, and Saudi Arabia. Um, and I, I, I don't have a comment about um, how uh, the Saudi government kicked out the troops with the invasion of Iraq. The issue, of course, was the justification for having troops there was the threat that uh, Saddam Hussein presented the kingdom. And when he was gone, they figured, well, the reason for the troops is no longer needed. and so. They, they got rid of the troops. Um, so that's, that's, I guess, my response to why that happened. Thank you all very much.